Uh, one of the other questions that Jared asked was, uh, why I'm amazed that God would love me? And the simple answer to that is that I know me better than anyone knows me except God. And yet even in knowing every ugly, sinful part of me, out of his great love for me, he sent Christ to die. Then he took it even further by opening my eyes to this truth. A number of years ago, I was a broken, abused 15-year-old girl with a very distorted view of love when I found out I was pregnant with our first son. When Austin was three months old, and I now, the ripe old age of 16, Aaron and I were married. For the record, I don't recommend that. Um, in case you weren't aware, marriage has a way of putting a magnifying glass to every single character flaw, insecurity, and self-serving tendency we have. It was hard. It's difficult at 41 even when you're married to a nearly perfect man. <laughs> but it was nothing less than impossible at 16. I'm unforgiving, selfish, faithless, unfaithful, and in constant pursuit of things to fill a void that only a true understanding of God's love and who he is can satisfy. It would make no earthly sense that I would be standing here right now, except for these two words, but God. There's nothing special or unique about me that it would make sense that God would choose to save me. And if all he ever did was save me, I would have it all. But he hasn't stopped there. I don't understand why God constantly pursues me. Even when I am not pursuing him, he refuses to let me go. He's placed people in my life to tell me the truth, his truth, and his word continues to teach and sanctify. He continues to show me grace, lots of it, when I don't deserve it. He's patient and kind to me when he owes me nothing and I deserve nothing. I say the wrong things, I do the wrong things, I think the wrong things, and still, he does not and has not given up on me. He just continues to pick me up from the ashes of my own making and chisels away at the parts of me that look too much like me and not enough like him. It makes me completely overwhelmed with gratefulness. And, and nothing that was never clear than this a uh, few months ago, we had family photos taken. And uh, our, our family is growing slowly, but it's growing. When the photographer sent me the final edits, she included the one that was meant to be a joke. Our two-year-old granddaughter is giving her best impersonation of her favorite book character, the wonky donkey. <laughs> All of us adults in the photo are smiling obliviously at the camera. It is by far my favorite photo. Because in this photo, I see that broken 15-year-old girl I did really good in first service. <laughs> and her once boyfriend and the impossible situation they were in 26 years ago. And all I can think about is how good God is. He's gracious and kind and persistent because I needed persistence. And he has been so merciful to us. It once again is a reminder that his grace really is amazing. from the New Living Translation. In that day, you will call your brothers Ami, my people, and you will call your sisters Ruhama, the ones I love. But now, bring charges against Israel, your mother, for she is no longer my wife, and I am no longer her husband. Tell her to remove the prostitute's makeup from her face and the clothing that exposes her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her as naked as she was on the day she was born. I will leave her to die of thirst, as in a dry and barren wilderness. And I will not love her children, for they were conceived in prostitution. Their mother is a shameless prostitute and will become and became pregnant in a shameful way. She said, I'll run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and water, for clothing of wool and linen, and for olive oil and drinks. For this reason, I will fence her in with thorn bushes. I will block her path with a wall to make her lose her way. When she runs after her lovers, she won't be able to catch them. She will search for them, but not find them. She will think, 
I might as well return to my husband, for I was better off with him than I am now. She doesn't realize it was I who gave her everything she has, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all my gifts to Baal. But now I will take back the ripened grain and the new wine I generously provided each harvest season. I will take away the wool and linen clothing I gave her to cover her nakedness. I will strip her naked in public while all her lovers look on. No one will be able to rescue her from my hands. I will put an end to her annual festivals, her new moon celebrations, and her Sabbath days, all her appointed festivals. I will destroy her grapevines and fig trees, things she claims her lovers gave her. I will let them grow into tangled thickets where only wild animals will eat the fruit. I will punish her for all those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me, says the Lord. But then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert, and I will speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there, as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground so they will not harm you. I will remove all the weapons of war from the land, all the swords and bows, so you can live unafraid in peace and safety. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me as the Lord. And that day I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the sky as it pleads for clouds. And the sky will answer the earth with rain. Then the earth will answer the thirsty cries of grain and the grapevines and the olive trees. And they in turn will answer, Jezreel, God plants. At that time I will plant a crop of Israelites and raise them for myself. I will show love to those I called not loved. And to those I called not my people, I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. Let's open with prayer. Father, this is a very difficult passage and I need your Holy Spirit to fill me and to fill the listeners. I pray, God, you would do wonderful things in the hearts of people with this um, difficult discussion. And so, God, please let my words be clear, precise, accurate. And I pray that the listener would, um, God, I pray your Holy Spirit would motivate them to really ponder what salvation is and how you love them. Like Ephesians says, I pray that, God, we might know the depth, the height, the width, that you, the love that you have for us, and may we be filled fully with it. I don't know how you do that, but that's a prayer that you want us to pray. We love you, God, in Christ's name. Amen. And again, Missy, thank you for sharing your story. I'm really thankful for Kaysen because Kaysen, your youngest son, has taught me this. My favorite. Everybody do that. It feels good. He's excited about something. He goes like that. And I'm kind of excited about this passage because it's a weird one. Thank you, Mark, for reading it. This is one of the passages in the Bible that if it was not in the Bible, I'm not sure the Christian bookstore would let you read this. So... This is a difficult passage. Today, uh, we're going to talk about the love of God, that it's an uncommon, unheard of love. But to begin, I, I want to use an illustration. About 24 years ago, in the month of February, my wife and I were experience, experiencing the coldest February 
of our lives. We were living in Russia at that time. They don't plow the streets. The sidewalks are full of ice. And it's just cold in Russia. It really is. And you have to walk everywhere to go shopping. Every day we had to go get our bread. Because you can't really buy it like we buy it here. We'd buy freshly baked baton French bread. And we'd get two loaves. Then we'd go to a local store and see if we could find cheese and milk and some other things. And we'd often get some of the fresh cheese and they'd slice it for you. And I can remember 24 years ago, my wife and I were in a store and she looked up and there on the shelf was a box of chocolate. And it was in a heart shape. And, and it was around Valentine's Day, so we decided to buy this box of chocolates to share it with each other. You know, and it was nice, covered with paper, you know, and uh, it, just, it just reminds you of home, you know. So we brought it home, we took the baton bread, cut it in slices, made some grilled cheese sandwiches, had some soup, and we were going to share this Valentine's Day chocolate after dinner. So there we are, we open it up, take off the cellophane, take off the top, and inside this is what the chocolate looked like. Brown, I won't say the word, chalky, crud, it was crud. We eat it, and Michelle goes, they did it to us again. They get your hopes up here in Russia, and then they slip in something else that's not the real thing. It's a fake substitute. And the chocolate was just bad. Like, we threw out the whole, the whole box. It was a lie, you know, and you're like, oh, I, I just want chocolate. Can I just have some good chocolate? And I think inside of our hearts, we are dying for the real thing, but Every day we seem to get fake substitutes. And what I'm specifically talking about is I'm talking about love. God's love is different than the love you and I have every day. And it's a love that all of us crave. I can prove that we crave it. I was doing some study on what is the number one topic of most pop songs. They say 85%. Of pop songs are about love. Most every show, that every movie you watch, is dealing with some kind of love. The Harlequin Station, which I'll never watch because I'm kind of scared I might get hooked on it, is all about love. Most books and novels that you read are all about love. It's because I think deep down we yearn to know it. In today's passage is we're going to talk all about the love of God, but it's uncommon. There's nothing else like it, because it's the real thing. And you and I are used to cheap substitutes. Mark read the passage. He read it out of the NLT. We'll go through the ESV on it. But let me give you an overview of what's going on. Starting last week, we talked about how the story of Hosea is about this prophet Hosea. God told Hosea, go marry Gomer. This woman's name's Gomer. And Gomer, according to God, was going to go and prostitute herself. So he was to marry a prostitute, a woman that was going to cheat on him. Their first child was in wedlock, and then she had two more kids out of wedlock because she was prostituting and she had two more children that were not Hosea's children. That's the story. Last week we said, why would God do that? And he did it for a very specific reason. He wanted to illustrate to the people at that time, the Israelites in particular, that they were loved by God, but they ran after all of these other idols. And in the same way that Hosea married Gomer, she left her first true love to run after all of these fake idols. You can say, what does that have to do with us? Jesus loves you like he really loves you. And we're going to talk about how he showed that love for you. But most of us, most of us would like to just have Jesus on Sunday and chase all these other kind of lovers from Monday through Saturday. Those other lovers being money, pleasure, entertainment, and just self. And Jesus is often forgotten and left behind. And so in a way, like Gomer, 
we treat God the way she treated him and are often unfaithful. I mean, when I look over this crowd, I'll bet many of you, I'll bet many of you really know that you're far away from God. Some of you aren't sure God loves you. I mean, there's times I remember when I really gave my life to Christ, I'd look in the mirror and I'd say, why would he even want me? I'll show you why. This is titled, The Uncommon Uncommon Love of God. But before we get there, I want you to go to Jeremiah 2.13. And there is a verse in here that shows us what the missing ingredient is to God's love. So you could say, what is the missing ingredient to Russian chocolate? They don't have any chocolate. That's a missing ingredient. (laughs) You need chocolate to have real chocolate. What is the missing ingredient comparing God's love to the love that we are used to? And you're going to see it here. And it's a massive difference, and it changes everything, but you're going to have to... I'm really going to ask you to think through this. Because at first, it, it, when you read the verse, it doesn't make sense, but then it will, and you'll be like, oh. And if you get it, it affects everything else. So in Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah is writing to the people of Israel as well. And it's basically the same idea. They're being unfaithful to God. And he tells them how they're being unfaithful to God, starting in verse 12. And he says, be appalled, O heavens. Be shocked. That means this should wake you up to where you're really broken about it. What is it? Well, verse 13, my people have committed two two evils, two sins. The first thing is they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and then they made or hewed out their own cisterns for themselves, but they're broken and they can't hold water. So he's comparing God, who's like a fountain of living water, always bubbling fully alive, full of life, to those other things that we chase that can't offer anything. They're dead. In a way, we're like the broken cistern. So what is God saying? And here's what I believe the message is here. In God is fullness. God is full of life. God always has, and he's always bubbling out. But we go to places that are needy, So when when God loves, he does not love because he needs to be filled. He's already full. So his love is clean. It doesn't ask of anything. He just wants to give. It's sort of like if you're a parent, you'll understand it when you have your first child. Your first child, when you have that baby, that baby cannot offer you really anything. You've got to do everything for it. But when you see that baby... All you want to do is give. You give because you want to. God is full. He doesn't love you because he needs you. How does this relate to us? A lot of people go to church because they really believe God will be mad at them if they don't pray. If they don't do their Bible reading in the morning, if they don't dress up right, God is going to be upset as if he needs you to be a good person. He doesn't need you to be a good person. He doesn't love you out of need. He loves you out of want. It's different. Human beings, since we're empty, we love out of need. And so the kind of love you're used to is a needy kind of love. You will love the person that you think is either beautiful or smart or talented because you're hoping they will fill you. I often tell my kids, Make sure you date somebody that already is full. Don't date somebody that's needy because they'll always be needing you, calling you, wanting you to be with them. And if you don't call them quick enough, where were you? It's kind of a needy love. It's a fake love. God's not like that. God's already full, so he doesn't expect anything of you. And if you can get through that that in your mind, it will change the way you live. Like So you can ask it like this. Why do you go to church? Well, because God's going to be mad at me because he needs me to work. Why does he need you to worship him? He doesn't need you to worship him. He wants you to worship him because he's the best thing for you. He loves you. 
So what you're going to see in this book of Hosea, this love is going to relate to Hosea differently than the way we would relate to Gomer. Normally, if our wives became prostitutes, we'd kick them on the street and never talk to them again. Because they stole from us. They ruined it. But watch how God treats Israel, who is unfaithful. The first thing is, well, just this is a cool verse. It talks about how, why God loves, and it proves his love. And actually, in Hosea chapter 2, verse 1, he, before he goes through the story, he already calls them my loved ones. But watch why he picked Israel. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. Meaning he didn't choose you because you had things to offer him. You were fewest of all peoples. So what did Israel have to offer God? Really nothing. But it was because the Lord loved you. God is love, so he loves because he's full of love. So he loves you because he loves you. So watch how a loving God that's full loves. The first thing we can say is a love that is full allows those he loves to choose who they will love. So he doesn't demand you love him. He wants you to love him out of choice. Worship is all about your choice. It's not about demanding. You can say it like this. He is not desperate, so he won't share his love. With another. He doesn't need you, he wants you, but he won't compromise on you loving him halfway. See, there's here's what I mean by this. God, I think people view God as a God who wants you to go to church and do things, and as long as you show up Sunday, he's happy. But you know what? You can go love everything else on the other days of the week. So it's like God, so you're walking with God on this hand on Sunday, and every the other lovers on this hand the rest of the week. God won't have that. God wants all of you or none of you. And he lays out this choice and he says, do you want to walk with me or not? It's your choice. Because he doesn't need you. He's already full. But he wants you. We almost feel like we're doing God a, we're doing God such a service by praying and being such good people. He doesn't care. He just wants you. The reason why he wants you to pray is so he can give his heart to you. The reason why he wants you to study the Bible is because he wants to help you. Not because you're doing anything for him. It's such a radical difference. You can say it like this. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I longed to gather you together. As a hen gathers its chicks, but you didn't want me. He's offering you a choice. And when you see God like that, it's a lot different than what I would say, even like the Muslim God. The Muslim God means you are his slave, means slavery. The God of the Bible is a God of love. Do you want me or not? And in this story, Hosea in verse 2 says, plead with your mother. Plead with her. Because what's happening is she is becoming a prostitute and it's breaking his heart. In verse 5, the mother's playing the whore. She doesn't want me. But plead with her. The second thing that a love that is whole does then, and this is where This is where I want you to think through this. Is a love that is full patiently waits while sin takes, he lets sin take total effect. Because God wants you, he wants you to choose him. He doesn't demand for you to choose him. He wants you to choose him. He will let you go to your lovers and let and abandon you while you go to your lovers because what, he, what you're going to find out, your lovers have nothing to offer, only humiliation, degradation, and slavery. But he'll let you choose it. And he's so loving, he's patient because he wants you to realize they have nothing. Look what happens in the story. You'll understand what I mean. 
In this story, you have in verse 2, verse 2 he says, plead with your mother, plead, she's, she's not my wife anymore, she's not her husband because she wants to go be a whore. So he lets her go. And then she goes and he says, lest I strip her naked and make her as the day she was born. So really, ultimately, I hope she doesn't get to the point where she be utterly, utterly humiliated. And then verse 6, well, verse 5 was interesting. For their mother has played the whore. She who has conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, my own, my drink. God already gave her everything, and now she's attributing everything to all these other nations. A lot of times we attribute fun and joy to the money we have or to the entertainment we have, and we don't really give God any credit. What's interesting about verse 5 is verse 5, according to Mosaic law, what should have Hosea done to Gomer at that time? Stone her. But he doesn't. He lets her go. He lets her play the whore. I, I want you to go to Exodus chapter 9, verse 15. I want to show you something very interesting. I've been reading this through my Bible reading through the, through the year I started. So I'm doing my Bible reading through this year. And I'm reading where Moses comes to... Um, where he's, he's going up against Pharaoh with the plagues. If you know the story, Israel for 400 years became slaves in Egypt, and they had to make bricks. And they cried out to God, set us free. So he sent Moses, and Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Moses said, forget it. And so Moses said, or Pharaoh said, forget it. Moses said, okay, Pharaoh, if you don't let God's people go, he's going to send you plagues. Ah, oh, send the plagues. So he pl sends plagues like, turns water into blood. Can you imagine taking a bath and all of a sudden the water turns to blood? Or you go to the, get a nice drink and you drink it and red starts dripping down. Ah, oh, what is that? Say positive, oh, positive, rotten. Then another uh, plague is our Pharaoh. No, my magicians can do that. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send frogs everywhere while you're sleeping. They're going to hop in your bed and up your undershorts. Oh, yeah. And they're everywhere and they stink and... You know, Pharaoh's wife slips on one, hits the, ah, they're everywhere. And so they sweep it up, put all the frogs in the Nile River, and Pharaoh said, oh, we cleaned it up, no big deal. So he sends gnats out that just get on all of everybody's eyes and in the ears of all the horses and livestock. And then he sends out flies and plague after plague. And then there's this really weird one where Moses takes some ashes from the kiln and throws it up in the air. And like fine mist, it goes out and it lands on all the Egyptians and they get boils wherever it lands. And they're itching like crazy and it hurts. But all the, Egypt, all the Israelis are okay. But the Egyptians are all breaking out in boils. And as I'm reading that, I'll be honest with you, I'm thinking through that. And I'm going, that's really cruel. Why would God do that? That's kind of mean. Isn't that kind of mean? I mean, could you imagine all those little kids of the Egyptians that get boils on their face? Because it's kind of mean. Or little Johnny, who's two years old, is getting his bath with his mom and he's scrubbing with blood. That's kind of mean. I... And then you read this in Exodus 9 15, starting in verse 14. Moses says to Pharaoh, For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. So there's nobody like God. And in verse 15, For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. The NLT says, I could have killed you. You know, and so I'm thinking through, oh yeah, God has every right to kill us if he wants to. Oh yeah. I deserve nothing. And so what will happen often is when we run after all these other lovers, all these, we leave God in the lurch, a lot of times God will let go. It says in, ALT, in uh, Romans 1, 
It says they didn't consider God worthy to be worshipped, so he gave them over, or he abandoned them, let them go. And what's happening in the book of Hosea, Hosea abandons Gomer to her lovers, so go over there, and what they're going to do, they're going to completely humiliate you. And I think for us, some of you, when you sin, a lot of times God lets you go. In verse 14, if you go to Hosea chapter 2, verse 14, it's, um, if you watch the progression, you have in chapter 2, so verse 7, um, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but not find them. So God is letting her go, and then he kind of takes their lovers away because they're probably sick of her. And in verse 8, and she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil. So she still doesn't recognize. And then uh, he takes that away too. And I'll take away wool and flax to cover her. So he's basically leaving her destitute, abandoning her. And in verse 10, look at verse 10 as a strange verse. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. What does that mean? That means God is going to allow her to be so humiliated that all she has left is him. That's so opposite of the love we, we, we think. We think if you offend God, he has nothing to do with you. No, what this is saying is, okay, you can turn to either your addictions, you can turn to wealth, you can turn to all of this, my prayer is that you'll reach the bottom. Like when you're, I know parents that say, my son has left, doesn't want to have anything to do with Christ, and just making terrible decisions. Addicted to alcohol, on meth. I hope he reaches the bottom. You know, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to human depravity, there is no bottom. What really the prayer is, is that they will get sick of going deeper and deeper into that stuff. To the point where, may God let them reach a point where they realize nobody else wants them but God. That's how much God loves them. God's pretty amazing. And when they reach that point, verse 11, I'll put an end to all their mirth, their feasts, their new moons, which is fake religion. I'll let everything waste away and I will punish her for the feast of Baals and she burnt their offerings. I'll just let it go. You can read this on your own. Um, actually, Romans 11.32 is a very interesting verse. It says, God, God has given all people over to disobedience so that, so that he might have mercy on them all. As explains in the first service that there's a difference between legalistic humiliation in evangelistic humiliation. Imagine you have a kid right here. He's about four or five years old. And he keeps disobeying you. And he, keep, and he swears at you as a father. Holds up the middle finger at you. Takes everything. And you as a father, I could pound that kid. I could say, you do what I say or I'm going to wring your neck. And I could. I could wring his neck. Shake him like that. Put him on the ground put my knee on his thing and say, you obey me. And let's say he says, okay, 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 I, I obey you. But at the moment that kid says, I obey you, have you won his heart? He'll hate you. That's what legalistic humiliation does. That's what the law does. It causes you to obey, but it never wins your heart. Evangelistic humiliation is hopefully that kid will come to the point where he'll say, man, dad, I'm sorry. I've treated you terrible. You've done everything for me. Will you forgive me? And when that kid's forgiven, the difference is that kid's heart has been won. So God is patient, hoping somebody will come to the end of themselves and look up and finally say, God, I am sorry. Some of you have never done that, actually, because you think God, all God wants to do is hurt you. No. 
He's waiting. This is a really interesting thing in chapter 2, verse 15. It says, I will, make, I will give her the vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. In the Old Testament, there's a story after they went to Jericho. They conquered Jericho, all the Israelis, and then they, there was all this gold. And they were supposed to bring the gold and worship God. And he said, but don't take the gold. And so he gave a clear will of God, don't take the gold. And some guy took the gold and he hid it. And so God's favor was off of him. But he didn't want to admit it. Nobody wanted to admit it. But they got thrashed in battle. And they reluctantly repented. Like look at verse, um, look at the end of verse 7 in Hosea. She shall pursue her lovers. She now will overtake them. She shall seek them. She won't find them. Then she'll say, ah, I'll go and return to my first husband. For it's better. This is reluctant. She, she's not getting anything. This is false repentance. And then she goes back to her lovers when she is eaten again. It sort of was happening here that they were hiding their gold that they were stealing. This one guy was. And then God decided not to bless them. And then the guy confessed and said, I stole the gold. I stole the gold. I did it. And actually they stoned the guy there. That was a a tough story. But because they reached this point of admission, confession, then they started winning the battles and they were able to take over the promised land. In the same way, some of you know what God's will is. And you're running and there's conviction in your heart. And every once in a while you come to church on Sunday and you say, I know, I want to be better. But then you go and you do the same thing again and again. I used to do this. I used to go to church on Sunday. The next Saturday I'd go drink. Ask God to forgive me on Sunday, knowing the next Saturday I was going to go do it again. It's kind of a fake forgiveness. And then I realized, man, I'm dying. And I had to confess. And confession is spiritual death. I'm done running. And when you get to that point, now God can change your life. And that's where a full God comes in. A love that is full, when a man finally forgives, a woman finally repents, speaks tenderly. Look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. That means bring her to a place where she has nothing but me. Nothing but me. And I'll speak tenderly to her. Another way, word we use is I will woo her. There I'll give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. That means the bottom, I'm going to bring it back up there. She shall answer us in the days of her youth. She's going to remember, she's going to fall in love with me again. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer my Baal. My Baal is another word for my master, my my guy who pounds me. I'm not going to call you that anymore. I'm going to call you my husband. i got a new relationship with you. I just want you. And I'll make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things. Meaning God is going to bless Israel, their land, and they will live in safety. In verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. I'll marry you. I'll be with you forever. There's a, I think the love of the world says when I sin, God no longer wants me, so I better be a good person. That's false love. There's a new kind of love that is going on. That's when I sin, God, he doesn't care. He's a nice God. He won't judge me. That's false too. What Hosea says, God wants me, but he wants me holy. So he let sin run its course so it will be burnt out of me and then all I want is him. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary, weary from sin, weary from running, and heavy laden, heavy laden is carrying the the shackles of the punishment of that sin. And he says, I'll give you rest. He's always waiting. How many times does Jesus say he'll forgive us? 70 times 7, meaning he will never stop 
loving us. Why does he do this? Why does he do this? Because he wants me to go to church and be a good person so I can finally wear a tie and comb my hair a little bit better. Is that why he saves me? Does he save me so I'll finally open my wallet and give money to the church so we can build bigger buildings? Is that why he saves me? Does he save me so, you know, golly, I'll vote Republican? Is that why he saves me? Why does he save me? It's the coolest verse in this passage. Look at verse 20. Let's start 19. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and mercy. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And here it is. And you shall know the Lord. Why does he let me go through that whole thing where I, I get sick of my sin, it burn out of me, and I come to him in patience because he wants me to know mercy. It is the most beautiful thing in the world is to know a God that loves me regardless of who I am. <laughs> when my wife and I were... Um, in Russia, after that terrible chocolate, two weeks later, we went to Switzerland, where we had what's called R&R, because we were in Russia for a long time. We went to rest and recreation in Switzerland. So we flew on Swiss Air, Geneva. We flew into Geneva, Switzerland, with the giant mountains of the Alps around, the snow on the mountain peaks. And my wife and I went to go visit a city called Bern, Switzerland, where her great-great-grandfather's from. We went to a store, and um, when we went into the store there, they had this weird kind of package called Toblerone. It says, Swiss milk chocolate with honey and almond nougat. It's kind of a weird package, though. It's not in a heart. It's in a triangle. What is that? And so she goes, oh, I heard of that. I heard it's really good. So we bought some of this. But it's not in a red heart. You know, I was looking for the golden ticket. wasn't in there. And look how it's made. It's kind of ugly. Isn't that kind of ugly? So we clicked it off and ate it. Now that chocolate, that chocolate. I mean, that chocolate. But the package, is, the, the package doesn't make any sense. There's another package that makes no sense. It's a weird package. It's a bloody man hanging on a cross with thorns on his head. Stripped naked. When everybody leaves him. That package makes no sense, but look close. That man on the cross, out of the fullness of God, out of the fullness of God, he gave his son for you to save you out of the death of despair. When you were dead in your sins, they caught up to you. So you could Know the love of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. My question is, do you know him? Do you? Some of you don't feel worthy. I'll just be honest with you. Some of you have never heard that the message is really simple. You don't have to be anybody. You just have to believe. Because once you believe, this kid who the dad showed mercy to, he's different. And he will do what his dad says because he wants to. This son only does it because his dad's going to beat him up. That's what old religion is. You know what grace is? Is when you just can't believe you're forgiven. I'll do whatever you want. I don't care. Have you ever understood that? 